welcome back. It is the Vegas Take Sharp and Shapiro. We're trying to get in touch with Anthony Scaramucci. We'll get him in a few minutes here. But, uh, you know, so I, I show up at the studio, and as you know, we have uh, we had these pranksters on. They're professional pranksters. And what they did is they went into the, the Trump Tower in New York, and they replaced the triggered Don Jr. book with a separate cover that says, Daddy, Please Love Me. So I offered this book to Michael Avenatti, who joins us in studio now. And uh, Michael took a picture of it. Uh, I gave it to him. And uh, it's a very funny tweet. It says, uh, looking forward to reading about your walks through Arlington Cemetery. As you recall, your extreme sacrifices and those of your other rich, privileged family members. And it's showing the book, Daddy, Please Love Me. Um, so, uh, Michael, will you actually read his book? In all seriousness, would you read it? If I got paid to read it or something, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's a fair question. I don't know. Uh, just, just for entertainment value. Because we I, I all know think of, I can think of like 173 other things that would be ahead of that on the entertainment value scale, frankly. <laughs> all right, fair enough. Fair enough. That's that's fair. That's fair. So you guys have been going at it left and right with Biff, with Don Jr. He took a picture with your ex-wife, put it up on Twitter. You responded. My question is, why won't he ever respond to you yet he just puts out a tweet and attacks you but yet won't respond to any of your tweets well he's a key look he's a keyboard warrior i mean this this is a guy that cannot handle any confrontation one-on-one uh he has refused to appear opposite me uh on any television show any radio show he won't debate me he wants no confrontation because he knows that that is not going to end up well for him that he he's going to get absolutely destroyed Uh, Because I'm going to go after him for the fraud that he is. You know, this is a guy that has never accomplished anything in his life. He was born with a silver spoon in his mouth and a gold toilet under his ass. I certainly don't disagree with you, but the guy we have with us on the line right now certainly has accomplished just a little bit more than I would say than Biff, also known as Don Jr. This is a guy (laughs) that lasted 10 days, though, right? 10 days, press secretary under under Donald Trump. Uh, He's known Donald Trump for years, and we're very happy to have him on the line with us. Your friend, Michael. Anthony Scaramucci, the Mooch. Thank you so much for joining us, Anthony. How are you? I'm I'm doing good, but let's do a fact. It was actually 11 days. Okay, so let's go over this, guys. Okay, if you fired on the 31st and you're hired on the 21st, but you worked every day, you got to count the days. It's actually 11 days. So, Mooch, we had a bet, me and Mike Lavinati in studio, that you would say that. He said you would say that. I said I didn't think he would, so I lost the bet, Anthony. You just cost me dinner. No, 100%. Of course, I got to say it. It's a constant fact checking debacle for me. <laughs> Fair enough. You me at a 9.1% of the career. You know Fair enough. I mean? Fair enough. Okay, so Mooch. By, uh, by the way, when you're working for Trump, it's like dog years. So it's all, it's, I almost lasted like a full Trump administration cabinet official. No, that, that, that extra day was like a sev- was seven years, that context, Mooch. That extra saying? day was like seven years, Mooch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that last day was particularly brutal. That was the day I got fired, but. But it's all good. I uh, mean, look, thank God I got fired in hindsight. I mean, what a debacle. Well, speaking of getting fired, uh, you were the one responsible for Rents Priebus getting fired. Is that fair to say? Um, well, I would I would certainly like to think I contributed to that. I mean, I think I think that uh, probably one of the worst people I've ever come in contact with uh, in the 55 years that I've been on the planet. Wow. And it was a very, very destructive guy. Uh, it's very different from Donald Trump, actually. I mean, at least Trump is uh, President Trump is like fully frontally uh, in your face, letting you know that, that he's a complete fraud. You know, he's at the microphones in front of the helicopter saying, "China, please investigate the Biden." You know, I mean, that's right. It, there's a weird part of that that I almost admire. You know, in, in previous case, it was all howdy doody, ha ha ha, and then he was backstabbing you. But you know, I, wanna, I want you to. I, mean, I want to ask Michael this question. I want you to imagine Trump and Bannon in the White House together during the fiasco that's going on right now, Michael. Could you imagine that? Oh, I, you know, I, I can't imagine that. I mean, those two together, uh, <laughs> I, I don't even know what that might look like, Mooch. But, you know, let, let me say this to, to Brian and J.D. Well, in the I list. think that's my contribution. I think that's my contribution <laughs> to American history. But I was able to, when my suicide vest was going off, and it blew up. It damaged Bannon so heavily that he left the White House two weeks later. So, <laughs> so to me, you know, I've, I've I've made a small contribution thus far, but that's the main one. There, there you go. But you know, I I do want to say this to the listeners and to JD and and Brian. Look, I, I, it, Trump has made a lot of mistakes over the years, over the course of his presidency, over the three years. A lot of mistakes, a lot of bad personnel decisions. But I'm going to tell you the biggest. One of the biggest mistakes that he's made, and probably the worst personnel decision, 
was getting rid of Anthony Scaramucci. Because you can say what you want about the Mooch. I'm a fan of the Mooch. I'm a friend of the Mooch. I love the Mooch. But here's the truth. The guy is very effective. Mooch, you are incredibly effective at communication. People like you. The press likes uh, Anthony behind the scenes. They really like him because, you know, he's a character. And he's, he's a very intelligent, well-spoken Listen, guy. I- and, and let me tell you something. Thankfully for the rest of the country, Trump got rid of him because had Trump kept him around, Trump would be in a much stronger, safer place right now. I do not disagree with that. I've said that on this show before. Okay, Mooch, here's a question I've been, I've always wanted to ask you. Well, I'm very flattered, you guys. He would have never kept the guy like me around, though. I mean, you know, I, you just look at the 81 people that went into the wood chipper after me. There's no way he would have kept me around, you know, because he, he doesn't, at the end of the day, there's a level of insecurity there and low self-esteem. He doesn't like having people around him that are accomplished and can, you know, look at him straight in the eye and tell him, hey, don't do that. Just just remember that I mean, the news cycle is moving so fast, but remember the letter that he sent to Erdogan. It was like somebody wrote it with a red Crayola crayon <laughs> and then handed it to Steno, you know? There's no way John Kelly or somebody like me would have allowed that letter to of leave course. the White House premises. M- Mooch, you know? can, Mooch, can you take me back to that last conversation? Uh, I don't know if it was a volatile conversation that you had with Donald Trump before you left the White House. Can you take me back to that last conversation, take us through that? No, my, my last conversation was quite positive. It was on Saturday morning. He he told me that I was a lucky guy, that the news cycle had already moved on to the firing and sacking of Reince Priebus, and that even though I had to take the reporter, that, uh, he was okay with it, and that he would see me in the office at 8 a.m. on uh, on Monday. Hmm. And so I was somewhat relieved. Wow. Um, well, the thing with thing with President Trump is he doesn't fire you. He doesn't like confrontation, and right. so uh, he had John Kelly fire me. And so then the question is, what changed between Saturday morning when I had that conversation with him, and Monday morning when I was fired? And frankly, I think it was a combination of things. But uh, I've gotten close to John Kelly now, um, and I think it was uh, you know. Uh, combination. It was like uh, President Trump and Chief of Staff Kelly saying, hey, let's clean house and we'll send we'll, we'll send Anthony out of here as a message to the people that were cleaning house. And so gotcha. uh, it was rough. Yeah, it was rough. And, and by the way, my relationship with John Kelly started out sorely because of it. But mm-hmm. we've now grown into personal friends. And uh, oh, as Michael good. knows, I invited him to my conference out in Vegas last May. He spoke at the Bellagio uh, where I interviewed him for uh, an hour. Uh, I opened up the interview by saying, hey, General, the, the last conversation we had lasted three minutes. It didn't go well for me. Are we, we going to be okay up here? Or what? <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad you were able to work that out. Here's another question. Well, I wanted. Three, three minutes, that's a, that's as long as the relationship that Trump had with yeah, Stormy. No, yeah, that's, three, three that's three minutes, the Trump fired. Stormy. Yeah, the, that's the rumor. Trump Stormy situation. So, Mooch, obviously I agree with everything Evan yeah. said. You're a smart guy. You're an accomplished guy. Why did it take you this long? You've known Donald Trump for decades. You've known him for a long time. You had to have known privately that this guy was a fraud. Why did you never speak up about it publicly until recently? Well, I wrote about it in the Washington Post. I, I, I would take you guys back to the August 19th editorial where, you know, I equivocated. I did something that I should not have done. I've apologized to people for it, but uh it was a little bit of a uh, cognitive dissidence, moral equivocation. And so what ends up happening is you're a Republican. No offense to Secretary Clinton. I'd never had anything personal against her. I was just trying to promote at that time Republican policies. And uh, and so it was, a, it was a choice. It's a hiring decision. You only have two people to choose from. And so I did an immoral equivocation. Uh, my liberal friend said, well, he hasn't really changed. 2015, uh, Donald Trump is this more or less the same as 2019. I think he's in mental decline. That's roughly right. Uh, but I did the moral equivocation. I did the, okay, these policies are going to be great. He'll rise to the level of the presidency. And then what you do is you stop your brain from thinking about the things that he's doing that are inappropriate. And uh and by the way, if you just look at the congressional members of the Republican caucus, that's exactly what they're doing. Uh, they're still doing it. I I couldn't do it. As Michael knows, and we had many conversations about this, I broke from him on child separation. I broke from him on the denunciation of the intelligence officers and agencies in front of Vladimir Putin. I wrote an op-ed last year, or April of 2019, this past year, on the press not being the enemy of the people. 
Um, and then when he went after the congresswomen, I said, OK, that's full blown racism. Sorry, can't handle that. And then once he started attacking me uh, and then started attacking my wife, I said, OK, he's obviously got a screw loose. He's in a full blown meltdown. And then in August, I said, look, I can't support this anymore. This is Trump Noble. This is like watching the first two episodes of the HBO series Chernobyl. <laughs> so for you, Mooch, it was personal. Melting at the core. When he got I'm personal, sorry? when he got personal with you, you're saying that was the final straw. Well, I would say the final straw was probably the attack on the Congresswomen, but that would have caused me. Remember, I was I was I worked for him. I worked for him on the campaign. I was. Uh, on the executive committee of the transition, when I was fired, I literally spent two years trying to defend him. So I would have probably just gone dark. I would have probably said, okay, you know, can't really advocate on his behalf anymore. Uh, I, I, let me go dark. But when he, when he attacked me, that's one thing. But when he viciously attacked my wife, mm. who is a suburban housewife living out on Long Island raising two kids. And a great lady, by the way. This, you, and a you, great you, lady. You, you made yeah, but Michael knows this. You may know this. I was in the throes of a potential divorce. She had filed on me. Uh, we love each other. We were trying to patch it up. Uh, it's two years since then. We're doing well. Uh, uh, President Trump knew that we were in trouble in our marriage while I was working for him. Uh, but just think of the boundaryless nature of this person. He's attacking her on the presidential Twitter feed. And so, you know, I tell people he may not have early stage dementia. I'm not a neurologist, but that's early stage fascism. Uh, full-blown fascism. You go, you're going after an individual and a private citizen. The reason why what he did with Joe Biden is so impeachable and so egregious is that the founders set it up in a way where if you have political power, you're not supposed to be able to use that political power against a human being that happens to be a fellow citizen of the country. And so, so when you think about it, uh, the founders set that thing up known as Washington as a place of service, uh, not a place of rule. And so those people are supposed to be serving the American people, and President Trump has a different view of that. So, so to me, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm a pretty straight up guy. I was going to probably just say, okay, he's not for me. I'm going to disavow my support and go dark. But then once he attacked my family members, uh, you know, game on, game on. I mm -hmm. mean, I'm not going to tolerate that, nor should anybody. And and guys, come on, do I look like Ted Cruz to you? <laughs> no, you don't. Like no, you, you know, don't. Yeah, come on, give me, give me a break. Let I mean, me. So, so I'm, I'm not a politician. I'm not going to equivocate to that man. Uh, and also, now that we have the American system on threat, where there's actually a party now that's decided that they know the guy is unequivocally guilty, uh, but they don't care, and so they're going to lie about it in an effort to keep themselves and him in office. I mean, it's an absolutely disgusting thing. It's a direct threat to our democracy. It's a direct threat to the republic. And if we don't have brave men and women like the ones you're seeing testifying today uh, go after him, um, what do we, what do we have? You know, it's a fragile thing, guys. So, you know so let me so let me uh, let me jump in, Booch. You know, let me let me say one thing, and then I'm going to uh, ask a question. First of all, you know, to my Democratic friends that that want to uh, make Anthony wrong and and want to talk about how long he supported the president, what took you so long, et cetera, et cetera. You're making a grave mistake. If the Democrats want to actually regain footing, if they want to take control of the White House, if they want to get back to a place where this country can no longer be so divided and we can be unified and move forward, if they want to save the republic, you've got to welcome people like Anthony Scaramucci back into the fold with open arms. You can't make them wrong for their past support of Donald Trump. You know, it's no different. I've used this analogy in the past. It's no different than, you know, one day – you're in love with a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a, or a wife or a husband, and then the, and someday, whether it's a year or two or three or 10 or 15 year, years later, sometimes you wake up and you don't want to be with the person anymore. You, you've run your course. You can't believe that you made the decision to be with them to begin with. So we can't make people like Anthony wrong. we got to welcome them back uh, with open arms, especially when they're willing to put themselves out there like Anthony is right now and really mm -hmm. be vocal about how important it is uh, that Trump be removed from office. So that's number one. And then second, I want to pose a question to you, Mooch. I mean, how do you think this ends? And uh, if you think it ends with Trump resigning or impeached, when do you think that happens? So I, I, I you know, I said in August, I, he will not make it to the nomination and uh, he will not run again 
And I think that's still the most likely outcome. So sometime between now and March, which is the LBJ time period, uh, March 1968, LBJ said not running for uh, re-election. I think that that's what's going to happen. And I think that's the reason why Nikki Haley's out there in a full-blown obsequious tour because uh, she sees herself as a vice president. So that would either be vice president for him if he somehow miraculously survives this or vice president for Mike Pence if he doesn't. So, you know, listen, I'm a money manager. I get a lot of things wrong. I, I get paid, frankly, to do well when I am wrong. And so I might be wrong about this, but here are the scenarios. Uh, uh, pretty sure he leaves office uh, on January 20th, uh, 2021, a disgraced man. And, and he'll say otherwise. He'll say that he made America great. Uh, and then it'll be a toss up as to who wins the election, depending upon who the Democrats put up. Or he somehow miraculously survives this. He'll probably jettison Mike Pence, a ruthless guy, even though Mike's been super loyal to him. He won't care. Uh, he puts Haley on the ticket. Um, and, you know, listen, you know, you guys may feel differently, but if they put up somebody like Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, I think it's a 40 state landslide for Trump. And so I've, I've said that consistently. Totally agree. Country's, country's not ready for socialism. Uh, and then you've got a five-year debacle where he's literally using the uh, the White House and using the government as a piggy bank. Um, and, you know, look, at what we know from the president, this is a personal transaction business for him. Uh, not only knows how much money he's made from our adversaries uh, doing their bidding around the world. And so hopefully all that stuff comes out. One of, one of the funner things or more disgusting things to think about, he's going to get impeached, may end up staying in office. If he wins again, he'll be impeached in the second term as well because he's so lawless. So he could be the first president of history to impeach twice. Hey, Mooch, but let me more, Mooch, let me ask you a question. The more scenario, though, is he leaves. Also, I think he's not well. No, I, I don't think, think he's well I think that hospital either. visit. Yeah. I'm sorry? I don't think he's well either. No, I think, yeah, no, I think that hospital visit and just him coming down those lower stairs at Air Force One in Texas yesterday with his uh, doctor with him, um, I think is a sign that he's not doing too well. Uh, it's either neurological or it could be cardiac related. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's a, if you look at his right leg, his right leg is sweeping now. Again, I'm not a doctor, uh, so I don't want to start making up, up things. But uh, it looks like he's had a stroke. You know, so, I mean, it's it, you know, possible mini stroke, having a hard time finding his words, things like that. So. Um, there'll, there'll be a reason that he doesn't run again, is my opinion. So, Mooch, let me ask you this. Um, who do you think the Democrats should nominate in order to win back the White House and why? Well, they got I mean, they have a weak field. I, I'm, I'm, I think one of the reasons why, Michael, the Democrats don't like me is I'm not one. You know, I'm a, I've been a Republican my whole life. Um, um, but I, I would say this, that uh, – um, the more moderate of the group is probably Buttigieg. If you could take Buttigieg's brain and put it in Joe Biden's body, you'd have a killer candidate. Um, unfortunately, if you watch uh, Vice President Biden's uh, performance last night, it would be hard to see him getting the, you know, making the, even if they nominate him because he fits the slot of calmness and stewardship and things like that, and he's moderate, it'd be hard to see him get going the distance. So, it would have to be somebody like uh, Mayor Pete or it would have to be somebody in that category uh, that's a little bit younger than Vice President Biden. I I, I still think that uh, Andrew Yang, I don't really know if you're allowed to say this on the air, so forgive me, but I think there's prejudice against him because he's agent, frankly. And so uh, if you listen to Andrew Yang and you listen to his presentation and what he's saying, what he's doing, um, he should be at the top of the polls. Uh, he's a moderate. Uh, he gets the new economy. Uh, he inspires young people. Um, he's somebody that, uh, if you put him up against Trump, I think he, I think he could manhandle Trump. Yeah, but Mooch, so let me, guys, but, me me looking at it. I think those are the guys I think would have the best best. You know, in terms of just their way they swing verbally. Yeah, well, Mooch. I mean, look, Andrew Yang. Um, I agree with a number of the things that you said, but he's got no shot of beating Donald Trump, especially in the key states. You know, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, et cetera. Um, you know, I think Mayor I, Pete. I, I agree. I agree with that. I'm just pointing out that he's he's got the verbal dexterity that uh, somebody like Joe Biden doesn't have. Well, that that's but that, that may be true. But Biden, let me ask let you. Me put it back to you. Do you think Biden can beat Trump? You know, I think of the candidates right now, 
I think Biden has the best shot of beating Donald Trump. Now, do I wish that Biden was 20 years y- younger? Absolutely. Did I do I wish that he did not commit as many gaffes that he does? Absolutely. You know, he's not a perfect candidate, but the Democrats have to be uh, careful and not allow uh, perfection to become the enemy of the good. And I think that, you know, I spent a lot of time when I was thinking about running against your advice, I might add, uh, <laughs> la- last year. Uh <laughs> In Michigan, in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, a lot of these swing states, because my attitude was if I can't figure out a way to win here, I'm not going to potentially run because that's the ball game. And when you talk to those voters, they identify with Joe Biden. They see Joe Biden differently than they see in Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders or some of these other candidates. Yep. I mean, let me let me ask you this question, Mitch. Do you think that Mayor Pete can win in those key states uh, you know, as a gay man, let's just let's have a really candid discussion about it. Do you think he can carry those states and win statewide in places like Ohio, Wisconsin? Oh, I, I, look, I, I, I may be naive to this. Um, I obviously I don't think he can carry the evangelical vote, but they wouldn't be voting for him anyway. Right. Um, I, I think that's less of an issue for him than sexual preference. I think the issue for him is his age. I think the issue is his experience. And but let me tell you something. I met him at the Texas Tribune Festival. Um, you guys are all no. He's very impressive. I no. He's very impressive. Yeah. Very intelligent. I mean, he's Except the most intelligent guy in the field. Absolutely. No. Absolutely. Yeah, Look, I've spent the time. Cool. I broke bread with him as well. I love the guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I just don't know. If, Twenty years. I don't think this is his time, and I also think uh, he's having a good run right now. Uh, but I think that those states that we're talking about, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, they rotate back to a more traditional Democrat. So it's sort of Biden Warden. Warren, excuse me, and I hope I hope it's Biden because uh, if it's Senator Warren, uh, the country's not ready for that sort of nonsense. Also, that nonsense doesn't work. And you know, again, we can all rail on President Trump, but one of the things that we learned uh, is if you could have Barack Obama's temperament and a deregulatory strategy for the government, you can unleash a lot of growth. And, and by the way, I think you know if you were rotisserie baseball like in your politician, you would pick Barack Obama's temperament, some of his swag and style. Uh, you would pick Trump's deregulation initiative, but you would, pick, you would pick Obama's deficit cutting uh, ideas. You know, he had the deficit going in the right direction and under control post-crisis. Uh, and what we've done in the Trump administration is that we've added two and a quarter trillion dollars of debt with no meaningful growth. Guys, we got two quarters of growth. Uh, Paul Krugman, not a guy I agree with a lot, but got this right. He said this would be a sugar rush for one or two quarters, and then we would revert back to 1.9 to 2.1 percent growth without anything more than more deficits to pay back. Mm-hmm. So, so you know, look, we're we're in a mess, and, and we're in a crossfire of people that are not really thinking about this in a way that they need to, which is long term for the American people. Mm-hmm. And again. Uh, you know, what I love about your show and what I love about the way you guys think, uh, we have to position the country, again, towards service, long-term thinking, and less about what is right or, or left about policy, but more about what's right or wrong about policy. And So um, I'm still waiting for that transformational uh, candidate, that post-partisan candidate. Um, but listen, you got to defeat Trump because if you don't take him out, he, in five more years— could do almost irreparable damage to the system. As, as hard as that is to believe, it's like we yeah. we hired a demagogue. We we, we hired Huey Long, Charles Lindbergh. Yep. It's as if uh, Roy Cohn had a baby with Joe McCarthy. <laughs> the baby was Donald Trump, and now he's running. The <laughs> I like that, Mooch. Uh, unfortunately, we got to go, but uh, I I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us. And I got to tell you something, man. When you come to Las Vegas, we would absolutely love you to be in studio with Michael if we can make that happen down the road. That would be great. Yeah, I'm I'm going to be in town in March, and obviously again. Let's do it. Our conference in May. Maybe you guys can broadcast from our conference. Love to, that'd be awesome. Love to do that, okay, Mooch. Great, I can't. Great to be on with you guys. Can't thank you enough. Thank you so much. There you go. Yeah, thanks, that, thank you, my Anthony. friend. That is the Mooch himself, Anthony Scaramucci. When we come back, another big guest, uh, John Kasich, will be joining us next on the Vegas Take. Be back right after this.